Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the Intro to Modern OpenGL tutorial series. In this video, I'd like to just take a moment and congratulate you, because if you've made it this far, you've made it past the hard part. You've got meshes and shaders. Why is that the hard part? Because those are the critical assets in feeding the GPU pipeline. The GPU pipeline needs some form of mesh and some form of shader, to actually draw something. It needs some data to draw, it needs some description of how to draw it. Once you've got that, everything really just sort of adds on and it's a lot easier to deal with. So if you've made it this far, if you've got your blue background with the red triangle, then congratulations. It's... yeah. And the other good news from that is, we're not gonna have any more ridiculous, we need to split up because there's such a ridiculous amount of things we need to set up. No. Everything's going to be nice sequential from this point, and that brings us to the first thing we're going to do in this nice sequential order, and that is texturing. Now, the thing about textures is you need some way to load them in, and that's something I'm not going to cover in this tutorial. I just want to talk about how to use textures with OpenGL, not here's how you can load your preferred image format. So, I'm going to be using one of many existing texture loaders. You can use, really, just about any texture loader you want, but I'm going to be using STB image, partially because it's simple and it gets the job done. It's very basic, very... you don't need to go through 10 million steps to set it up, and also because it can be statically linked pretty easily, so you won't have to go through another big giant library setup. You just need the header file and the C file, and all's good. And both of these or both of those will be on GitHub. So, I'm going to go ahead and add files. I'm going to add an existing file, stbimage.c and .h. And I'll add them to both targets. And just like that, I should be able to build. And, well, there you go. It, it built just fine. So yeah, that's what I'm going to be using. And now that we have our way of loading textures in, we can actually use them with OpenGL. And guess what? I'm going to be creating a new class for this. So I'm going to go to the new, the little new button here, create a new class, just like with everything else. It's going to call this class Texture. It's going to have Destructor, Virtual Destructor, Assignment Operator, and Copy Constructor, as with everything else. And everything else looks okay. So I'm going to go ahead and create. And sure. Make sure you add it to the project. That would be bad if you don't do that. So. As with everything else, I'm going to delete the copy constructor implementation and I'm going to tap everything back one. And speaking of, I don't think I actually tabbed it back in either like mesh or shader. Yeah, didn't tab back shader, so I'm going to go ahead and do that while I'm here. You don't have to do the tab back thing, I just. That's my style. That's, that's how I like. Well, that's my coding convention. So, yeah. That's completely inconsequential. You don't need to do that. But anyways, I'm going to move my operators to private, or, you know, my copy constructor and assignment, because, well, I don't... I'm not going to be implementing them. You can implement them if you want. You can do some texture copying with OpenGL. It provides some neat utilities for that. But I'm not going to be doing that in this series. So, yeah. And with that, this provides us our basic interface for textures. We have constructor and destructor and all of that stuff set up. And... I'm not going to be doing any manual... I'm not going to have a manual way of specifying texture data. I'm not going to let you, like, generate pixels in a bitmap and send them to the texture, at least in this implementation. I'm going to say every texture you want is going to be something you load from the hard disk. That's just the way I'm setting this up. If you want a constructor for manually designated mesh data, you can do that. I'm just... I'm not going to do that. So, I, because of that, I'm going to include string.h because our only constructor is going to take a const std string reference file name. We're going to be loading a texture from a file. And that's, again, why we have the image loader. And, yeah. As for what the te actual texture is going to do, OpenGL actually makes texturing pretty easy. There's only, really, one thing the texture class needs... well, technically two things, but there's only one major thing the texture needs to do, and that is a bind function. And all this is going to do is once you call the bind function, it'll set OpenGL up to start using whatever texture you're binding. 
Although I am going to have an integer here, an unsigned int called unit, because you can actually bind multiple textures at once. From, actually, I believe the current limit is 32 textures at once. So any unit from 0 to 31 is perfectly valid. So, yeah. So this is just a way to distinguish between which texture you've bind. You can bind some texture is texture 0, some other texture is texture 1, some other texture is texture 2, and you know, all that stuff. And the unit lets you determine which texture is which. And I'll talk about how the unit system works later. It's For now, we're just going to have everything at unit 0. And yeah. Now, as for the actual data in the texture class, that's going to be just like everything else we did. There's going to be some gl, unsigned int, so gl u int, and that's going to refer to whatever lo number, whatever handle OpenGL has given us to refer to our texture by. And I'm going to call that m underscore texture. And there. So now we have a text. Now we have some place to store the handle to the texture, I should say. And really that completes the texture class. There's nothing nothing else that I really care about here. Oh, other than including gl slash glue.h and including just string, not string.h. Sorry about that. Make sure this is just string. And other than that, I think we are just about ready to implement our constructor and destructor. So for the constructor, I'm going to make sure it takes in the file name. And the destructor, I'm not going to do anything just yet. Now, this is going to be a little bit interesting here, because since we are loading a file, and since we are using a texture loader, what I'm about to do is going to depend on what texture loader you're using. So if you're not using STB image like I am, you're going to want to, at this point, go look at your texture loader, see how they load textures from a file name, and go ahead and do whatever code that is. However, if you're following along with STB image like I am, then, whoops, then here's how you do it. You're going to include STB not with angle brackets, just stbimage.h, that's the header file for the image loader, and it has two functions that I care about. STB, stbi, excuse me, okay, load, and stbi image free. Just like that. Separate like underscores, and they do take parameters, I'm just, I'm not passing them yet, I just want it fleshed out. So this is how we're going to load textures. We're going to use stbi load to actually load the texture data, and we're going to use stbi image free to delete our texture data from the CPU once we don't care about it anymore. Now stbi load takes in a, f well, I should say, it writes a few different pieces of data. One is the texture data itself, so that's an unsigned, whoa. I'll worry about that in a moment. First off, I want to have an unsigned end for width and height and for num components. These are the three non-texture data pieces of information that STBI will give you. It'll return the width of the image, the height of the image, and the number of different components it has, if that's relevant. Most of the time, it isn't, but, you know, it's there. So, yeah. Now, f to actually use this, it takes in, a, well, a few different pieces of, of data. It takes in the file name. So I'm going to use file name dot, dot c string to get the, well, the file name. The x and y, those are actually the width pointer and height pointer. So I'm going to pass in the address of width and the address of height, so it'll write there. The comp is the num component, so I'll pass the address of num components. And the required components, it's it's again, it's there if you care about components. I'm just going to put 4, because that should give me everything I want. If you care about components, you can do that. It's it's just a, pe it's just a feature of the image loader that I particular, don't particularly care about. And I'm going to store all the data as unsigned car pointer. Well, okay, I'll just sort store as regular car pointer. I don't... Hmm. <laughs> sure, I'll just store it as a character pointer. Why not? I'll call that data, because it's the image data. Mm. I'll call it image data, be more specific. And at the end, we're going to free all the image data, just like that. And that 
Well, really, that concludes getting the image data. It's that simple. And we don't need to do anything in the destructor here since we're deleting the image data as soon as we are finished constructing the object, as soon as we're finished sending everything to OpenGL. So right now, it's not really doing anything. It's just loading the data and then immediately deleting it because we're not doing anything with it. But that's going to change. Now, to send it to OpenGL, remember, OpenGL stores everything in buffers. So we're going to want to gener generate some space for it. So I'll go ahead, gen textures. I want to generate one texture at the address of m underscore texture. So there, it's going to generate, it's going to generate space for one texture, and it's going to give us a handle to that in m underscore texture. Once we have that space for texture, I'm going to go ahead oh, gl bind texture. Now there's actually a target used different types of textures OpenGL can have, like 3D textures and volume textures, I believe. And there's other stuff like that. I just care about your basic gl underscore texture 2D. Your basic 2D texture, the type of things you're used to working with in image programs and whatnot. There's a lot more, but that's what I care about in this class. So, yeah. And for the actual texture we want to bind, that's m texture, the thing we just gave space for. And really, once you do this, you can call the function gl text image 2D and send in all the texture data. But if you want, this is technically optional, but it's a good idea, I think. But before you actually specify the texture data, you can specify a few other things about the texture you're sending. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. The way these parameters work is by the gl texture parameter function. And there's a few different one versions of them. The one I care about right now is texture parameter i. Now, just like with bind texture, you pass in the type of texture you want to affect. In this case, for texture 2D, 2D textures. And there's a few different constants you can pass in. In this case, I care about OGL texture wrap s, which and I'll set this to just geo repeat. I'll talk about what this means in a moment because I actually want another one of these for texture wrap T. Now what this particular texture parameter does is it controls well texture wrapping. If I read some location outside of the texture boundary, say the texture is 512 pixels wide and I'm looking for a pixel 513, this this lets you control what happens if you well, on the x and y axis repeatedly. So s, I believe, is for reading outside the texture width, and t, I believe, is for reading outside the texture height. I may have those backwards, but yeah, it works like that. And this parameter just tells you what behavior should happen. In case of repeat, if, in my example, if it's 512, text, or 512 pixels wide, I'm looking, at, I'm looking for pixel 513, then it'll just repeat. In other words, it'll go back to the beginning and start from there. So in that case, it would read pixel 1. You can also put a GL clamp, meaning it will just read black or some, you know, default non-existent color, I believe, which I believe is black, but yeah. It'll just read some black color, so see the low, hey, you went outside the texture bounds and, you know, stuff like that. And that's done with GL clamp. But yeah, that's how that works. And you can specify it individually on each x and y axis, so you can have different behaviors if you want. I'm just going to have them at repeat, which I also am pretty sure is the default behavior. But you know, it's there. Thought I'd let you know. And there's one more that I want to set right now. Texture parameter f, this time. Again, it takes in texture 2D, the type of thing we want to affect, which I would say geo texture min filter. I'm going to say geolinear, and again, I'm going to duplicate this because I'm going to do the same thing for mag filter. And here's what this does. What happens if the texture is close, takes up more pixels or fewer pixels than it specifies? For example, if I have a 512 by 512 texture, like in my example, it's very unlikely that I'm going to be rendering exactly 512 pixels wide and exactly 512 pixels tall of that texture, especially once you get into rotation. So this lets you determine the, how it handles, well, reducing or in, interpolating or extrapolating or whatever. 
the texture in those cases. So min filter is for minification. When the texture takes up fewer pixels than its, well, its resolution. And in this case, I'm specifying GL linear, meaning it will line linearly interpolate between the existing pixels to try and produce, well, the most accurate image it can with linear interpolation. There's also GL nearest you can pass in here, which doesn't try to do any filtering, it just takes the direct pixel sample, to, you know, it's that type of thing. It's how you get that sort of pixelated effect when things get, go off into the distance. But I'm doing linear, so I'll do some sort of filtering in that case. And mag is the exact opposite of the minification. It's when the texture takes up more pixels than it, it has. So for example, it's 512 pixels wide, but it's consuming 765 pixels or something. And how do you extrapolate? How do you make it bigger? And I'm also using linear filtering for this, with GL linear. So that it, well, it'll interpolate between the existing colors. Which, and I think that's more impor important in, a mag, in the mag filter, but hey. And you can play around with this, set them different for if it's smaller with minification or bigger with magnification. But you know, it's there. I thought I'd let you know. And those are a few different pe texture parameters. There's, I believe there's more texture parameters like this, but I, in my experience, I found these are the ones you usually care about. And yeah, again, feel free to play around with these and see how, see the different effects you can achieve with it. But at this point, I'm ready to go ahead and send our texture to the GPU. And here's all the different parameters it takes in. First one being the target. As with everything else, it's a 2D texture, so I'm gonna say GL texture 2D, so it knows, hey, how to, you know, how to interpret the texture data, or, you know, how to send it the data as, not to send it as 3D texture data, we're sending 2D texture data, you know, that type of stuff. Now the level, that's part of a technique called MIP mapping, and the way that works is you can have textures of different resolutions, but all of the same image. So for example, you can have a 128 by 128 texture of a brick wall, then a 256 by 256 texture of a brick wall, then a 512 by 512 texture of a brick wall, then a 1024 by 1024 texture of a brick wall, etc, etc. And the idea is it will use the higher resolution texture when it's the image is nearer to the camera, and lower resolution texture when it's further from the t camera. And that's, and that's to help reduce filtering artifacts, so, such as stuff you know you can encounter with linear and nearest filtering, or any other type of filtering, really. And, you know, it's another technique to, to help with minification and magnification and get the texture appearing, appearing as crisp as it can. I'm not going to cover that in this tutorial, but it's there if you want to play around with it. So I'm just going to say zero, meaning the default level, the one that's going to be used, well, by default. The next parameter is the internal format. This is how OpenGL is going to actually store individual pixels on the GPU. You can well, tell it how to format them. And I'm just going to go for the basic GL underscore RGBA, meaning it's going to store the red, green, blue, and alpha parts of it. You can go, you can play around with this, choose different ways of storing pixels, such as with just red, green, and blue, no alpha component, or BRGBA, or something, or BRGA, or, you know, the whole, all the different ways of formatting pixels. You can play around with that. I'm just going to use RGBA because I don't have another reason to, but there's a lot of things you can play around with with that. Now width and height, those are the width and height of the texture, surprisingly, so those are going to be width and height. And remember, those are set when we actually load the texture, STB, or STB, or yeah, wait, that should be STB image dot H, excuse me, right here, but yeah, <laughs> excuse me. The width and height are set when we call STBI load, it just, it finds the textures when we load them, and it's that simple. So yeah. Anyways, the rest of the parameters. There's the border. I'll be honest, I never use this, so I'm just going to set it to zero and move on. I'll look it up in a moment to see what it actually does, but again, I, I never actually use it. I don't I don't know if it actually does anything particularly useful. So now, the format. This is actually the input format. This is, how, this is the format of the data you're sending to the GPU. And in this case, it's going to be RGBA. That's the format that STB image loads it in. As for, whoops, the type, that's how each individual, well, it's, that's like this, the data type. It's, well, more like this, the data type. So how are the pixels stored? Are they stored as a series of integers? Are they stored as a series of bytes? 
In this case, it's going to be GL unsigned byte. And with that, I actually am going to make this unsigned car pointer just to make sure it is indeed unsigned. So, yeah. And the pixels, the finally, the parameter we've all been waiting for, this is the pointer that has all the data of, the, well, the pixels. And that'll be image data. And with that, that should complete the function call. And that completes our constructor. So as for our destructor, going to be just almost as... Or <laughs> what I'm trying to say is the destructor is going to be really easy. Easy, because all we have to do is say gl destroy... Or okay, gl delete textures. I'm going to store destroy textures for some reason, but okay. And it takes the same parameters as gen textures. We want to delete one texture at the address of m underscore texture. And that'll just completely delete our texture once the once we're done with it. And there, that completes our constructor and destructor. So all we have left at this point is the bind function. And I'll put it below the destructor, sure. So it's going to be void texture colon colon bind, taking in some unsigned int unit. So how does this work? Well, binding a texture is as simple as calling the bind texture function with gl texture underscore 2Ds, because that's what type of texture we're representing, and m underscore texture. And this will make it so that all future texture operations will be using m underscore texture, or the texture stored there anyways. However, for using the individual units, you're going to need a different function, gl active texture. This specifies, well, whenever you call this, this will change which dip which texture OpenGL is working with. Again, you have a whole bunch of different textures. You can access them with gl underscore texture and some number, such as texture 0, which is the default. And yeah, so you can have a whole bunch of different active textures like that. A neat little trick you can do to so that you don't have to do, do a giant switch statement and choose the appropriate gl texture depending on it is just do gl texture 0 plus unit because geo textures stuff is ordered sequentially. So this way, we'll set the active texture unit to whatever unit we specify. So, and if it's plus zero, then it's just going to be zero. If it's plus 31 or something, it'll be texture for 31, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So we'll set the active texture unit, and then it will bind our texture to that unit. So whenever we read from that texture unit, it'll be using that texture. And again, I'll talk about texture units once we start using them, which will be immediately after we finish binding, but yeah. One thing you do want to do if you do this, though, <laughs> if that makes any sense, well, is to include cassert.h, and you want to assert that unit is greater than or equal to 0, and unit is less than or equal to 31. Because OpenGL only has geo texture 0 to 31, so if you are using this trick, you don't want the thing going out of range. So this will ca cause the assertion to fail if you do pass in something that will cause, well, that will set an invalid texture unit. And, well, there. So with that, that really completes our texture class. We've done all we need to do on the C++ front other than actually use a... And I almost completely forgot about this. We want to make sure image data is not null, because if it is null, then something has failed. So, if image data is null, I'm just going to do use stdc error, and I'm going to include io stream so I can use that. I'm just going to use stdc error to display a message of texture loading failed. If I can spell it right. Failed for texture. Yeah, for texture, and I'll just pass in, add on the file name, then std and l. And just like that, We've displayed the error, texture failed, whatnot, and all is good in the world. So with that, now we actually have completed the texture class. So I can go to main.cpp, and I can load in texture. So I'm going to create a texture, I'll call it texture, and this will be in dot slash res slash... Hmm, yeah, I'll, I'll just say it's in res, and it'll be bricks.jpg. So, there. And that'll be our texture. And what we'll do is, after we bind the shader, I'll, hmm, yeah, after we bind the shader, I'll just say texture.bind, so that this way we'll, oh, bind to unit 0. 
so this wave will be using the texture when we draw, and we'll draw it. But wait, if I run, it's still red. Whatever happened? And why on earth did I not get an error? Because there, I shouldn't have bricks.jpg in there yet. Huh, one moment. And apparently, the reason it didn't fail is because I already have a bricks.jpg in here. So, there you go. This is the texture I'm going to be using as an example. You, of course, you can use any texture that your texture loader supports. In case you heard it somewhere before, the power of 2 thing, where it has to be 512 by 512 like this one is, is no longer relevant. It hasn't been relevant since GLSL or OpenGL 2.0. So you don't need to worry about... Yeah, you don't need to worry ab about ha making sure your texture is a power of 2 if you heard that somewhere. But yeah. This is the example texture. You can use any texture you want. If you want this particular texture, you can get it off of GitHub. It'll be in the resource folder, of course. Well, well it is. <laughs> and yeah. So this is what it looks like. And, well, there. But now as for the reason... Oh, and I almost forgot. While I was gone, I went ahead and looked up the reason... Or the, what the whole border thing is... The border thing is about. Apparently you can have, like, a one-pixel border automatically added to your texture. And you can do that by setting border to 1. It's sort of like a boolean. It's either 0 or 1. And if it's 1, then it'll add one pixel border both top and bottom and left and right. And if you do that, you'll need to add 1... or excuse me. You'll need to add 2 to both your width and your height to account for that border. So yeah. It's there, but I never use it. <laughs> so, again, so yeah. Now back to the problem at hand. If I run this, we don't see it. our texture showing up. It's still showing us a red triangle. What gives? Well, if you look at our... not our bricks. If you look at our shaders, the reason's pretty obvious. Our fragment shader. The shader that determines what pixel the GPU draws to the screen is saying the pixel, always red. Doesn't matter what data we have, it's just going to be red. So, unsurprisingly, the GPU is only drawing red pixels onto the screen. So, yeah, we're going to want to change this if we want texture to show up. And fortunately, GLSL makes this pretty easy. GLSL has a function called Texture2D, which reads a pixel from a 2D texture. And it takes in two parameters. The first parameter will be the unit, whatever unit we want to read from. So, yeah, this is where that unit comes into play. We can read from unit 0, we can read from unit 1, we can read from any unit all the way up to 31. So that's where the unit comes in. Of course, in our case, that's going to be unit 0, but you know. <laughs> and our second parameter is actually where do we sample it from? What's the x and y coordinates? And this is actually a little bit interesting. Because this isn't specified in resolution. For example, this point right here won't be 384 by 256 or whatever the location is. No. OpenGL does all texture locations by coordinates from 0 to 1. So 0 being the left of the texture, 1 being the right on X, 0 being the bottom of the texture, and 1 being the top on Y. And that's how it reads textures. That way, it's resolution independent. I could go in, do a whole bunch of stuff to those bricks, make it fancier, 1024 by 1024, double the resolution. And the same drawing code is going to work just fine with that extra high resolution texture. Or I can use a basic fill-in texture, like 16 by 16, just to get the idea across. And that's still going to draw just fine with the exact same code. So yeah, this way texturing is resolution independent. It doesn't matter how much or how little your detail or how much little detail your texture has, it's going to work just fine. And that's how this works. But, of course, we're going to need the coordinates. We're going to need to figure out how to, well, what the coordinates are. And that's going to be a little bit interesting. I'll just put together an example really quick. For your sampler, what you want is you want a special type of variable called a uniform variable. That's a variable in GLSO, which is updated by the CPU. So essentially this is a variable that both the CPU and the GPU have access to. We can read and write to it, well, actually I'm not entirely sure if you can read to it from the CPU, but you can definitely write to it on the CPU, and the GPU can read from it. So, I'm going to have a uniform sampler 2, 2D, which is the type of data that this texture unit is. It's a, it's a sampler, it's some way of reading texture data. And 
I'll call it diffuse, because that's the type of data we're going to be reading from here. That's the specific type of texture data, it's just the diffuse texture. Our coordinates, let's just specify something. Let's specify a vec2 of 0 0.2 by 0 0.2. There. We're reading some pixel. So if I run, well, we're sampling a black pixel. <laughs> it's some pixel in the texture, and apparently it's black. If I change it to something else, so let's say, I don't know, 0 0.8 by 0 0.2, maybe that's something... Hmm. 0 0.8 by 0 0.35, sure, why not? Maybe this will be black? Okay, that's still black. <laughs> but you know, you get the idea. You can specify texture coordinates and it'll read it. And apparently I'm getting unlucky and just selecting black pixels today. Granted, there's a lot of black pixels to read, but still. No, actually, let's try 0, 0. Because I'm pretty sure that that's actually not a black pixel. Okay, it is. <laughs> well, never mind. I, apparently I can only select black pixels today. But yeah. Of course, we're not really particularly interested in just reading one pixel for, on the texture for every single pixel on the screen. What we'd be more interested in doing is sort of reading pixels in some meaningful way. We want to read pixels, well, more than one different pixel, depending on where we are on the mesh. And that is texture mapping. And what you really want to do is somehow specify some location on the texture for each vertex, and then be able to say, okay, interpolate between these two points, and then draw that pixel. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So, what we're going to do is we're going to change our mesh a little bit, so that we can support some texture locations. Some, and we're going to call this, this will be a GLM VEC2 called text chord. This will be, well, the position on the texture that we're mapping to the vertex. And this will take in a const GLM VEC2 reference called text chord, and it'll set this under this dot or arrow text chord to text chord. There. So now we have the texture chord actually in the, the mesh, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean very much right now. So what we're actually looking for is something like text chord VB. We're going to add that to our enumeration here. So we have yet another bu vertex buffer for the texture chords. And here's how this is going to work. What we're actually going to need to do is we're going to need to change the way we're setting up data because, well, by adding extra data to our vertex, our positions are no longer sequential. We, for instance, well, if I, yeah, if I read a position here, then try to just read the next piece of data, that's going to be a texture coordinate, and then a little bit of the position data of the next vertex, and that's no good. So, I'm going to do this with a vector, well, with like an STD vector. So, that's the way I'm going to do it. You can do this with just basic arrays, but I like doing it with vectors, because that way I don't need to... I don't run the risk of forgetting to delete the data at the end of the constructor. So that's, that's my personal take on it. You can do it with arrays if you like. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to convert our vertex data into actual lists of just positions and lists of just texture coordinates, so that I don't have to do any of this... well, any of this with the... so I don't have to do any offset setups. I just can send the data directly. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to create an std vector of glm vec3. And this is going to be called positions, sure. And I'm going to have another vector of vec2 called text coords. And I'm just going to say positions.reserve just automatic already or ahead of time, allocate the total space. Yeah. Reserve num vertices, and same thing for text chords. Just going to reserve all the space needed. Wait. Yeah. Hang on, wait. Does, reverse, does reserve take, require taking in the size? Taking in size and bytes are just number of elements. I honestly don't remember. I'm actually going to stop and look that up, because I've completely forgotten if it takes in <laughs> the number the number of elements or the size and bytes. I I don't use it that much, so I don't know. So yeah, one moment. And yeah, it does reserve in number of elements. So, 
well, there you go. I, I just don't use the reserve that much because usually I use vectors when I don't know how many elements I need. And, and that's why I am doing this, by the way, because I know I'm going to need num vertices elements, so this way it isn't reallocating memory over and over again as, well, to try and figure out how much space it needs. So yeah, that way it doesn't need to reallocate when I'm actually adding data to the list. And that's totally optional. You don't need to do that. It's still going to work if you don't do it. But yeah. Now I'm going to do a for loop for, over, over my array of vertices. So I'm going to do for i equals for unsigned at i equals zero, excuse me. i is going to be less than the num vertices, i plus plus. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say positions.pushback vertices sub i. So it's going to get the vertex of the current location and it's going to push back its pos into the list of positions. Then here I'm going to say textcords.pushback textcords sub i dot oh wait <laughs> vertices sub i dot textcord excuse me. So yeah this is converting our array of well, like this is converting every all our positions and text cords into a simple list of just positions and just text coordinates. And and yeah, that's that's why we're doing this. And because we're doing this, we can change this to size of position sub zero. And see, this is one of the reasons why I didn't do size of vertex because now I can just change it to positions without any anything like that. And I can pass in hmm the address of positions sub zero because I don't believe it'll let me just pass in positions as is. But this will let me just pass in the address of the first element, which should work. And yeah. So now let's copy all this. And let's set up another buffer. This one for text chord VB. And there's gonna be num vertices times size of text chord sub zero. We're gonna pass in the first text List the first element in the list of text chords, or the address of the first element of the list of text chords. <laughs> That's going to give us a, a pointer to our big list of text coordinates, which is what we're trying to go for. And with that, it's going to have two floating point elements here, so that should be all we need to change there. And this, in this case. I'm... wait a minute, something seems wrong here. I'm gonna copy this. Okay, I thought something seemed wrong. I forgot to... Yeah, I forgot to copy the bind vertex array... thing. Hmm. So bind vertex array 1. So this is gonna be for array 1, and I'm gonna also enable the attribute array for, well, array 1. And there. So now with all that out of the way, that should store all our texture coordinates. Or in the, the scope of right now, I should be able to build, oh, and actually specify the texture coordinates. So let's do that. It's going to take in that, and it's going to take in a vec2. I'll just pass in 0, 0 for now. And actually, let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and go about mapping our texture coordinates for the triangle. So, if I want to sort of carve a triangle into this texture, 0, 0. That's going to be the first position, so that one's correct. The middle point is going to be at texture coord 0 0.5 and 1. So, 0 0.5 and 1.0 here. And for the other lower left corner, that should be at 1 on x and... 0 on y, because it's over here, so I should be able to say 1.0 here, and 0, 0.0. So yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and space all this out. And yeah, there there we go. That, <laughs> that should specify all the texture coordinates. Now we're not using them right now, but... Oh yeah, it helps if you include texture. Dot, oh, maybe that's why it didn't work. Maybe it's because I forgot to rebuild and include texture. So, okay. Hmm. Is it just vector? Okay, it does. Excuse me. I always want to add .h to things I shouldn't. Error. Ah, I thought that would cause a problem. Okay. 
So I'm just going to create a getter for it. It's going to be inline glm vec3 pointer. I'll call it, sure, git pass, and it's going to return pass. Well, return the address of pass, rather. So yeah, and it should be capitalized. And that's, that's what my getter is going to be like. And it's going to be a glm vec2 git text chord. And it's going to return the address of text chord. And you don't have to return by pointer. I am, because I've found it generally to be more useful. But you don't have to. And with that, I believe now I sh should be able to go to text back to here and do this properly with not dot pass, but dot get pass. And this, not with dot text chord, but dot get text chord. And since these are pointers, I should ne need to dereference them. And that should build. Oh, take that, but I always want to add dot h to things I shouldn't. Just see assert. And num components. I misspelled it. Again, I really don't care about the components. <laughs> oh, good lord. I'm just screwing up everything today, aren't I? Invalid conversion from unsigned int pointer to... Okay, is it with a file name or something? Oh, because these are ints, not unsigned ints. Excuse me. Wrong type. So now that I have width and height... GL texture parameter I was not declared in the scope. Interesting. Huh. Now that, I actually don't know. One moment. And it's because I used the wrong function. It's geotextparam, not texturparam. Adder. So, sorry, I, I wanted to write out the whole word. <laughs> so now if I build... There. And we should... St it should run. Ooh. And that would explain why... <laughs> it's actually sampling properly now. Well, sampling from a pixel in our... Fragment shader, which just selects a pixel. So yeah, that's why I was just reading black. Because I, I didn't recompile and whatnot. So yeah, now that it's actually binding the texture properly, it is reading f that. So, now that we've done that, I actually want to test this out. I want to see if I can get something different. So 0 0.3 and 0 0.8, sure. Ah, so you see, now it sampled a slightly wider picture... Yeah, er, slightly wider pixel from the texture. It's drawing that all over the place. <laughs> but, really... I want to... Yeah, I, I'm done playing around with the texture coordinates now. I want to actually use the texture coordinates we specified in our mesh. So, the way we do that, now we have a new attribute specified in our mesh. You see, we have... Well, yeah, as you see, we're creating new attributes and whatnot. So, I'm going to say attribute vec2 text coord. And, there. So now, we're reading in the text cord into the vertex shader. And somehow, I want to interpolate this and send it to the fragment shader. Now, this is actually pretty easy. OpenGL has a type of variable called a varying variable. And what a varying variable is, is, is two things. One, it can be shared between shaders. So, if, for example, if I have a varying variable called text cord 0 in the fragment shader, Actually, yeah, I'll put it above uniforms. That's my convention. Wait. Oh, it needs to be of a spe special type, so a varying vec2 texture coordinate 0. So it's a varying vec2 te called texture coordinate 0. And I have a varying vec2 texture coordinate 0 in vertex shader. Then here I can just say text coordinate 0 equals text coordinate. And now the fragment shader is going to have access to the text coordinates. So I could just say pass in text coordinate 0, and it's going to take in whatever texture coordinate the mesh wrote to text coordinate 0. But, there's another cool thing about varying variables, and that is when the OpenGL reads it in the fragment shader, it'll actually interpolate the value. So we don't have to worry about doing some linear interpolation of text co texture coordinate here, because it'll already interpolate it when it sends it to the fragment shader. So we already have the proper interpolated value in the fragment shader, and we just need to sample, and there. So this, in and of itself, will almost work. But there's one more thing. In the shader.cpp, 
we need to bind the attribute location. This is what this is all about. This is why this is where I'm going to explain this. Because just because the mesh has the attribute in it doesn't mean the shader knows about it. So that's the way or that's the reason we have these. This is telling the shader well this is mapping here. Yeah. This is mapping the attribute in our GLSL shader to the shader or to the attribute in the mesh. That's what the bind attribute function does. So attribute one is going to be text coord. So it's going to find the attribute called text coord and bind it to attribute one. As you see in our mesh, we're storing where we bind attribute one. Well, wait. Oh, no, take that. Bind vertex array is at the end of the function. I don't. I don't know what I was doing there. <laughs> Sorry. That's to debind it at the end of the function. I don't know why I thought that was part of vertex attributes, but yeah. Since we are binding, as you see right here, the texture coordinate data to attribute 1, then, well, this will send all the texture coordinate data in the mesh to this attribute in the shader. And there. So with that, the pipe, our little pipeline of data should be complete. I should be able to build. Remember to build this time. And run. And look at that. We have our texture. If we look at the full-on texture, you'll see... Well, I don't know about you, but that looks pretty much like what we were trying to sample with our texture cord. So our sampling's working correctly. And, yeah. So with that, we now have a texture-mapped mesh. And this scales perfectly. You can have the, any type of mesh texture mapped like this. And yeah, so there you go. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And I'll see you in the next video, where we're going to start moving our texture mapped mesh around the world. So thank you. See you then.